thermal drift is uh, white noise and um, at the least significant bit level. And the, uh, the 60 dB per bit uh, rule of thumb comes, comes, from, comes from, from wanting to have the variance of the quantization below the SNR of your signal. So we have to have, we have to we have to measure these things, right? But that, yeah, yeah, no, that, 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 that is, I guess I was in, a little inarticulate before. The quantization noise is just you just add more bits, and I think that that's not fundamentally a problem. But the but the the way most A to D converters are built is they have um, in effect amplifiers inside which do sampling and holding. So you sample it and you hold it, and there's an RC time constant associated with that hold. And you don't want the thing to droop while you're converting it. Maybe that's okay, but but there are implicit gains. And if those gains are not if those gains are not matched very carefully, or if there aren't calibration signals routed around the network, and there will be there are in general functions of temperature. And even though the temperature is being exquisitely controlled here, I'll, I'll, I'd be willing to bet you that, that that Lisa will have to trans will have to transmit other signals around the network every once in a while just to, to, to be convinced that the A to D converters are working. Anyway. So the problem here if you're trying to measure, um, if you're trying to calculate H, is you need to know the, uh, the noise and you need to know the signal. And the, uh, the noise is given by the spectra that, uh, that I talked about before through the transfer functions. Uh, again, it's the spectrum of the noise times the bandwidth, which is one cycle per year by hypothesis in this, in this one measure of sensitivity. And then you've got to divide that by the RMS gravity wave response, and it's conventional to multiply by five. So I'm going to very quickly show you an algorithm, which is a cookbook for calculating both the numerator and the denominator here, and then some examples uh, under various conditions. So the cookbook for calculating the denominator, which is the gravity wave signal, is that you pick which choice, which which TDI come? By the gravity wave signal, you mean that you have a, a sine sort of gravity wave at some frequency. Yeah. Yes. Uh, what do you get out in terms of y? Or? Yeah, because because of the linearity, of course, you get a, a sinusoid and gives you a sinusoid out, and and so <coughs> excuse me. So the um, but but each of these uh, alpha xp have different tr um, definitions transfer functions. So you just play the sinusoidal gravity wave through the transfer function that you specify, which, cal which cancels the clock and the, and the optical bench, the clock, the laser and the optical bench, um, and then see how, what the relation, what the RMS output is given a unit input, for example. Or, so, and you trace, RMS output for alpha or, for alpha. or for whichever one you want to do, and I'll show you examples of all of them. But, but you do exactly what you just said. You, 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 we're going to do sky and polarization averages, and so for every, you pick random points on the sky. So you've got two coordinates for the right ascension-like and declination-like coordinates relative to the array. Two other numbers specifying the polarization state. So four numbers for each point. You you then calculate using Hugo's uh, formula the the psi i's, which depend upon the spacecraft position and the orientation of the of the um, of the array relative to the gravity wave and the polarization state. From the size, you calculate the little y's. Those there were formulas earlier. Then you you just Plug them into the uh, to the transfer function. If it's if it's x, you use the transfer function for x. If it's p, you use the transfer function for the definition of p. And uh, that then uh, uh, gives you uh, the the output you would get had you formed that that particular TDI combination. And it's very useful to check this against the long wavelength limit. And this comes to a point that Kip made earlier, and I'll expound on this. You can get analytical expressions in the, in, the, in the limit where the wavelength is large compared to LISA. You can get analytical expressions, and you can test your codes uh, uh, and find some errors, some class of errors, by, by requiring that those two agree, being sure that those two agree. And then you just iterate that. You, you do that for frequency one, and you do it for n sources. Then you move one frequency bit over and do it again. Then you just you build up then the sensitivity curve as a function of Fourier frequency in this way. Actually, this is not the sensitivity curve. First, I'm telling you how to calculate the RMS gravity wave response. I'll tell you about the sensitivity in a second. Let me just digress to say that the long wavelength limits are given in um, 
uh, some of the references that I have there. And so, <clears throat> so you remember that the, that the size were proportional to h, and when you play it through the transfer function for each of these things, in the general case of unequal arm lengths, the, uh, a general triangle, not all the same arm lengths, the um, RMS gravity wave response is proportional to the second time derivative of h. So you get, you get suppression at low frequencies. Now, zeta, as, as uh, Kip pointed out, has a very special property that if the arm lengths are equal, then zeta uh, cancels to second order, and, and the first non-zero uh, contribution is at third order. So zeta is, is in some sense, well, is in that sense, insensitive at low frequencies to gravity waves. And I'll show you some plots in just a second. So here's an example of the RMS gravity wave response for alpha as a function of Fourier frequency log log uh, for the nominal equilateral triangle case. What, what you're seeing here is the, the fact that at low frequencies it's coming up like f squared because of that because the long wavelength limit alpha was proportional to h double dot. And as you get to the point where the, where the wavelength of the, of the radiation is comparable to the wavelength, to the, to the dimensions of the apparatus, then that's no longer true. And averaged over the sky, you see uh, a response which is roughly constant. For some other combinations, this is combination E, you get the same behavior at low frequencies, f squared, but because of the transfer function uh, uh, due to gravity waves, you get nulls. Now, it happens that these nulls are going to cancel, are going to come at frequencies exactly where the noise also has nulls, and so that the response is going to be OK. But, but, uh, but these nulls in the, are real in both the numerator and the denominator of that, of that expression for the uh, sensitivity. So here's what they look like in, in, uh, for all of them. So this is RMS uh, gravity wave response for a unit uh, excitation as a function of Fourier frequency log log. They're all coming up, well not all, many of them, all but zeta are coming up like F squared. Zeta is coming up like F cubed. It's, it's strongly suppressed. This here to here is one order of magnitude. Uh, at low frequencies. At high frequencies, as, as Kip alluded to, the responses are comparable with the exception of the, of the nulls due to the transfer function for some of the observables. And again, this is just linear algebra. There's nothing, nothing tricky going on here, no. Okay, so that was the denominator, the RMS gravity wave response. The numerator, you need to get the noises, and I've talked about that from the prephase A or from measurements, you know the, you have an estimate of the spectrum. You, uh, I like to convert these to the power spectrum of Y, which were all these plots that I've shown you are in terms of delta F over F. Uh, you write down the uh, transfer function and you just uh, Fourier, trans these Fourier transform a square and that gives you the spectral modulation. And so that gives you the time domain representation of the noise and it looks like this. So what's plotted here is the logarithm of the spectral density of the TDI canceled uh, combinations. X is the unequal Michelson. Zeta is the symmetrical Sanyak. Alpha is uh, the one that I showed earlier. That's the green one. It's a function of Fourier frequency. So after you've played all these things, all the noises through the transfer function, and then and then multiply times the raw noise of the proof mass noise and the um, shot noise out here, you get spectra which expressed in terms of delta F over F, which look like this. So loosely speaking, here's shot noise with modulation. Loosely speaking, here is proof noise played through the transfer function. So now you have the numerator of what you need for the sensitivity here, and you got the denominator from the, uh, uh, from the previous calculation. To remind you, we're trying to calculate this. We have the power spectrum of the noise. That's, that's this graph that I just showed you. We multiply times the bandwidth, one cycle per year, take the square root. That gives us the RMS noise. And using the prescription that I showed you, you can calculate the RMS gravity wave response as a function of frequency. So you have both the numerator and the denominator, and then hence you can calculate the sensitivity, which is the magnitude of the of the signal averaged over sky and polarization 
that you have to have in order to get an SNR of 5 at each of those frequencies. So this is it. This is the, this is the one that's always published. This is the unequal arm. This is the, the Michelson on the case where it's equal arm. So what's plotted vertically is the logarithm of strain sensitivity H versus logarithm of Fourier frequency. What's happening here is you're seeing uh, uh, the, um, the noises expressed in these ways are, are constant at low frequencies and the signal is suppressed, so you, therefore you require a stronger signal at low frequency to overcome the noise because the transfer function to gravity waves is not so good at low frequencies. So this is proof mass noise dominated here. Here you're all shot noise dominated. And because, I, because shot noise is white phase, which may be a more the way that you're more used to thinking about them in terms of frequency, you differentiate that and you get uh, uh, f, to the, uh, f to the plus one and then, um, anyway, it's f to the plus two in, this, in, this, in, this, uh, in this, this kind of representation. So anyway, it comes up, the phase noise is coming up like this and these wiggles are all real. Maximum sensitivity about 10 to the minus 23 at about a few hundred second wave. So the way people often think about this is this is the amplitude of a uh, periodic source of the binary system that uh, it could be detected uh, if there's no source confusion. Exactly. Um, uh, with the one year integration time. Right. And as Kip alludes to, uh, Strophany and others have, have uh, discussed the fact that at low frequencies there's likely to be, almost certainly, going to be a confusing background, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a second, about how you might get out of that. That was for the unequal arm Michelson case. Oh, sorry. That was for the Michelson case under, this, under, this, under the, uh, so the uh, specialization to equal arms. These are the other... Um, uh, TDI combinations, alpha, zeta, uh, u, e, and p. They're all about the same at high frequencies, and as Kip pointed out, it's only at low frequencies where zeta is, um, is significantly suppressed compared to the others. So, so it's for frequencies that are, say, 10 of them, uh, roughly speaking, one cycle every 100 seconds and lower, that zeta is relatively insensitive. At higher frequencies, they're all comparable. And in fact, this trick can, can be used. Um, uh, Tom Prince, Shane Larson, and uh, Massimo Tinto are, are exploiting the fact that, uh, that, that, uh, that there is important signal coming in from the zeta combination at high frequencies to, uh, to, uh, to, to optimally add the signals from the three possible interferometers to get, uh, to get uh, better sensitivity. Now, uh, why is it that alpha has this uh, peculiar behavior thing? So um, well, okay, Pete, Pete Bender likes to call this one of the Sanyak uh, things for that reason, and this, he calls this a symmetrical Sanyak. The, the mathematical reason is if you look at the, at, the, um, uh, at the number of delays which go into the thing, you can put a, uh, a, a, a zero or a, a suppression of the of the uh, of the sig signal at a, at certain frequency at, at for this peak. So, so it doesn't. So the gravity wave required required here is being suppressed a little more than it would have had you had you off shifted it a little bit in terms of uh, to double double delays. The X is in, involved double delays, for example. So if you shorten the R length, so the floor broadens out, is this out and still takes off from basically the first Okay, so the question is, what happens if you shorten the arm length? And this is, if you, if you divide by the arm length by three, it looks like this. And if you divide the arm length by 10, it looks like that. And if you were to make it three times longer, Sorry, that's phenomenal. If we make it three times nine, it looks like this. There's a, not for all these combinations, but for the unequal arm Michelson combination, Shane Larson has a very nice tool on the web that you can play the parameters with and, and uh, play, play the game. And that, that would be for the, for the, for, for the red one here, X. But these, these others are, 
the, the qualitative behavior, I think, is not not mysterious. It, you know, it just when you when you, for example, make the arm length three times longer, you're in the long wavelength. You have to go to bigger waves to be in the long wavelength limit. So this just shifts over here. But of course, for constant optics and power, the shot noise goes up. And so this then becomes a sort of a it's shifted this way and scrunched a little bit, and then the converse is true if you go to shorter arm lengths. And of course, you don't have to do it for equal arms. Uh, this is an example of um, the Michelson combination for uh, if you were to have a configuration which is isosceles, where these two arm lengths were equal to the not least the nominal, and this one is not quite twice it. This is the uh, uh, so-called X Michelson interferometer, the one with this is the vertex, and Y and Z, which are that vertex and that vertex, are this one, and the zeta has now, because the arm lengths are not, it's not an equilateral triangle anymore, zeta is coming in uh, as H double dot rather than H triple dot, and so the efficacy of using zeta to, to measure the noise independently of the uh, gravity wave is somewhat lost. And you can have, you can, I mean, this is sort of fun to do. You can get a, you can make catalogs of these things. For example, this is, here's PQR, which are other combinations, and they all have, uh, they're not fundamentally different from what I just showed you for X, Y, and Z. You, the zeta is, of course, zeta. It's, it's now coming in second order. And you get, you get something that has roughly the same sensitivity as X at low frequencies, uh, with, with details different. Okay, so how might you exploit that information? This, um, uh, as has now been sort of beaten to death, the different TDI combinations have different couplings to gravity waves. And the symmetrical Sanyak at low frequencies is, uh, is, uh, is to some extent insensitive to gravity waves, but contains information about the noise. So the idea then is you look at, say, X, the Michelson combination, simultaneously with uh, zeta to isolate signal plus noise and noise only. Um, and I'll show you some plots in just a second. There's also a sort of a, uh, an idea, a clever idea by, by um, Craig Hogan and Pete Bender to uh, take the spectra of X, Y, and Z, not, not X, Y, and Z themselves, but their spectra, and combine them in such a way as to, as to get at, uh, in, a, in, a, in a somewhat better way, get at uh, uh, gravitational wave backgrounds. So. This is X and zeta, so the idea again is you down here where the, where the astrophysics suggests that we're going to be confusion limited. We have zeta, which is insensitive to gravity waves, and X, which is sensitive. And this is a plot from a paper that Massimo Tinto wrote uh, showing if you were just to take uh, a confusion, no, if, if the only gravity wave sources were confusion limited uh, binaries from the galaxy, and you looked at the, you, you formed X of T, you Fourier transform it in square to get a power spectrum. If there, were, if there were no signal, you just see this, which is the spectrum of the noise. If there are a gravity wave background, this is sort of the, the guess as to how that might look. So X would, would look like this, and then back down, because it does see the gravity wave background. And you wouldn't know necessarily whether that was a real gravity wave background or, or a malfunction of one or more of the proof masses. But zeta would look, if, if zeta were operating normally, it would look like this, because it would be totally insensitive to that gravitational wave background. It would be orders of magnitude suppressed. So by looking at zeta, you measure the noise independently. Looking at x, you measure signal plus noise. OK, there, there are, of course, uh, problems. Uh, the actual LISA detector will necessarily uh, have, have lasers that do not have the same center frequency, and there will also be Doppler shifts. The, um, a consequence of that is that uh, the optical bench noise no longer cancels. I'll show you a plot. And noise from the ultra-stable oscillators, which are used to count these fringes, now comes in. Now, the, the bad news is that ultra-stable oscillators uh, are only stable at about uh, maybe one part in 10 to the 13 in, for count, rate, count times of 1,000 seconds. And so this would introduce unacceptably high noise if you did nothing. So there are tricks to, to do something. Uh, I think uh, uh, Ron Hellings and uh, Carson Donsman 
um, uh, have an idea which is uh, further elucidated uh, by Massimo Tito, Frank Estabrook, and me. And the sort of the bottom line is that by, by, by sending extra signals around the network to sort of calibrate out the USO, you can, it, it'll work. But it now is looking a lot more complicated. It's looking sort of messy. And one consequence is that the that the optical bench noise, which look, used to look like this, this is the this is the noise in the X um, observable, the unequal arm Michelson. This is proof mass noise and shot noise modulated. In the old days, if they were all same center frequency and no Doppler shifts, this noise canceled exactly. It could be made. To, those are the so-called capital V's, the optical bench noise. Now they don't cancel exactly. They come down to here. They cancel acceptably, but not exactly. And this shows what would happen to the noise if you did nothing with the 10 to the minus 13 USO. You'd be totally swamped. So you have to. You're either forced to flying a better clock, requiring that the center frequencies be pretty close to the same, minimizing the Doppler shifts, or uh, uh, well, those things. There's a, tra a trade-off between those parameters. And if you're, if you're forced to a 10 to the minus 13 clock by technology. Uh, which may be the case. The, the, the clockmakers are not, not optimistic about about improving this. Then, then you have to do something. So let me just summarize. Um, Lisa can be analyzed in terms of uh, symmetrically in terms of the one-way links. You can take those time links and those time series, those one-way link uh, delta F or Fs, offset them and add them in such a way as to cancel the main noise sources or suppress them if, in the case of time-varying arms. It, uh, I'm sort of keen on, on TDI as a framework for system engineering. You can, you can make trade-off studies. If, if, for example, there were some way to, to radically reduce the Doppler shifts, you could pick orbits that got the Doppler shifts way down. And if you chose to spend money to, to stabilize the center frequencies of all those uh, lasers, then you might be able to trade that in terms of money against, uh, against the uh, USO capability. So there's a system engineering uh, aspect to this that, that, that I personally am sort of uh, keen on. Um, you can calculate things across the Lisa band, not just in one wavelength limit. And it has the applications that I've mentioned are the applications uh, that I showed you. Uh, the sensitivities can be exploited to get at the background. You have some robustness against system failures. If you, if you take all the data and you lose two links, you've still got an experiment. Um, to some extent, a limited extent, you can design for certain waveforms by taking the, uh, the signals and taking, uh, for example, alpha minus beta, you can force, force uh, the sensitivity, you can move the sensitivity curves around to be better at certain frequencies than others. So if you had a specific signal you were looking for, you could play that game. Uh, and finally, something I didn't talk about, uh, you can discriminate signals and noises based on the differing transfer functions. If, for example, there were, um, for example, x, there's, there's an eight pulse response to gravity waves, but there's a, there's a two pulse response to, if there were some giant glitch in the proof mass someplace, then, then uh, you can discriminate that class of, of, of non-stationary uh, noise from, uh, from a gravity wave. And with that, I'm going to quit. Thank you. So, uh, what is going to be delivered now? Right. Um, well, what I would like to have kilometered down is, uh, in, the, in the idealized case that I've talked about here, the, the, the six YIJs and the um, six ZIJs sampled at times that are appropriate for whatever combinations you ultimately want to do. You can't, you don't have the, probably don't have the bandwidth to send, send everything down. Um, that's the, the bandwidth is not a fundamental limitation. It's only a third of an AU away. But the, but the, um, the DSM link is something that uh, Bill Faulkner and others worry about. So you don't need to kilometer everything down if you don't want to. Worry about in terms of data rate, I mean, you have to track the space, track the Lisa array um, with the DSN longer than you might otherwise like to. You might want to store the data and only have two or three tracks a week and just dump it. But I think you, you, in a simple case, you want those 12 time series appropriately sampled at the, at the right times. In the more complicated case, which um, 
is the final reference in that, in that set of references I gave you at the beginning. There are additional telemetry things that, uh, that Ron Hellings and uh, Mossimo and Frank have identified as necessary to, calculate, to remove the USO. So appropriately sampled means uh, how often? I think once a second at the right time, Chad. So the bandwidth of the signal might only be one hertz, but as Bonnie alluded to earlier, you, gotta, you, gotta, you wanna nail it at the, at the right time so that when you do the combination, uh, they cancel, this, the noise is canceled. Now, on LIGO, it's regarded as crucial to have an enormous amount of housekeeping data to make sure everything's functioning properly. No doubt, Lisa will be similar. And, and so, I presume there will be pressure to telemeter down a lot of that, or do you think you do enough onboard processing that you can reliably identify anything that's not uh, functioning properly? Um, I, I unfortunately have had some bad experiences with not having enough telemetry data from spacecraft recently. So I'm in favor of telemetering down more rather than less now. Um, but there are limits to what you can do. So you have to plan ahead, I think. Well, what are the limits like? To well, if it's an X-band link between the, between the Earth and the uh, spacecraft, then uh, the numbers, I don't know what I did right there. The, the, sort of the, the, for example, the Cassini link, which is a, an example of a high, high data rate link, is, is about um, 10 to the fifth bits per second. So you, you can get a lot down, but you have to, uh, probably for reasons of cost, you want, to, you want to store it and then burst it down rather than continuous tracking. The DSN problem is, a sol in my opinion, is a, it's been raised, but I think it's a solvable problem. You just have to do it. You know. So 500 kilohertz is sort of the reasonable X-band. Uh, I don't know what I said. I should have said uh, 10 to the fifth, one, one 100 kilobits per second. 10 to the fifth is, is, is something that can be done. And, it's, and that's, that's for Cassini from Saturn. We're much closer, but on the other hand, we, want, we have smaller dishes and less power. So you know, it might be a reasonable number. I mean, if you, if, this is something you can go, one can go look up and argue with the telemetry engineers. And the issue, I presume, is how much DSN time can the mission afford? That, that, that's a, that's an, that is an issue, and, and, um, and I'm not well qualified to comment on that. But it's not a fundamental problem, it's just... And do you assume that you'll really be working at X-Band rather than K-Band? Um, I, 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 I think I'm remembering the baseline right that it's X-Band. Uh, KE band is uh, uh, you can you can get uh, six, sixty d more you can get much more data down per unit time at KE band, but um, but uh, I believe the baseline is X. And why is that? Is NASA just switching over to KE? band? Well, I'm a, I'm a KE band enthusiast, as you may know, but um, uh, spacecraft managers are very conservative folks in general. And they would like someone else to be number one, I think. And by, by the time Lisa comes around, there'll be there'll be a few number ones. There's no telemetry, for example, on the on the Cassini uh, K event. It's just it's just used for the Doppler tracking experiments. So the DSN is actually committed, I think, but it's a chicken and egg thing. You have to sort of work up to it. And I think it could it could well go with K event. Yeah, with Lisa, eight years off. Yeah, sure. It's a long time. I don't know when the decisions have to be made, but it's a long time. So if we don't telemetry down all the Ys and all the Zs, what other options do you have? And well, you could form any of the variables you have to be able to communicate to the spacecraft. Presumably, for instance, if you want to form PQ and R, um, you have to know what's going on on the distant spacecraft. Well, y yeah, you do, but you could imagine a situation where you where you have. Um, and I don't ad, I don't advocate this incidentally, but you could if we, but you could imagine a situation where you where you, uh, you you know the orbits very well. You have to update the, to get this thirty meter thing. You'll have to update the um, well. Okay, you, you know you know the orbits very well, so you could in principle calculate all these things on board. You could calculate x, y, z, p, q, r, alpha, beta, gamma. You could calculate all these things on board. And just telemeter down those time series. Yeah, the right, thank you. 
Do the spacecraft communicate with each other? Right? And they, 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 down they, 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 I believe that's the baseline, but in any case, it would be easy to do so because you just modulate the light. So it's yeah. assumed that only one of these spacecraft is transmitting down. I, I, believe, I believe that's the baseline for the player. So, so to compute, say, P, which is um, uh, beacon mode. Whichever one, okay. Right, yeah. Uh, I mean, you're, you're saying that, say, the vertex spacecraft would transmit its phase its phase readouts to one of the distant spaces. It would just transmit. If, that's, if P is twin where one of them just transmits, it would just transmit. One of the other two um, would, would have to get the, <clears throat> and I haven't thought about this in terms of the robustness, in terms of losing length, but, but the information is all in principle there. I mean, it can be routed around the array to, to a spacecraft that has a computer on it. And you could just form this. But you do have to root it around. Something. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. You got to keep track, and you have to have a buffer that's that's maybe as one you put out order a minute long to, to initialize the situation. But these are but these are um, are really not difficult problems. I don't think. Um, and it's not difficult problems. People do this stuff on the ground. The DSN does this stuff on the ground with you know yeah, operationally. Just, I mean, just kind of from the viewpoint of doing data analysis, it seems that. The maximum information is obtained by having all the whys. I think the, having the whys. Stored on the ground. Yeah. So in the future, we can create any signal we want. Yeah. Yeah. I, I certainly subscribe to that viewpoint. You do have to, however, though, have the Y sampled at the right times. Yeah, right. So there is that there is that issue yeah. that you've, you've made an inexorable decision on the computer to sample things at the right time, unless you're going to send down uh, a. a uh, more bit, more bits than you might otherwise want to send down. But these are system system engineering issues, and I'm sure the system engineers, you know, given given given, you know, given a week, think of, could come up with great solutions. Given a week. <laughs> given a day, or whatever. Given a week. How does the I'm sorry, I couldn't hear the question. How does the sensitivity depend? Um, the direction of gravitation, gravitational wave. Yeah, well, everything I've showed you was averaged over the sky. Average. Right. When all the plots that I showed you were averaged on the sky. I don't have plots um, for specific directions, but um, so I can't show them to you. But 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 it's just the same prescription. You you specify the position of where the gravity wave is coming from. Calculate Hugo's size of eyes. Plug it into the canceling uh, noise canceling equations and and. That's it. What I have done, I have not done a lot. What I've done is little bands around around the sky because the, iso the background may not be isotropic; it may be predominantly due to the galaxy. And and yes, it looks a little different, but not, but the ones that I've looked at are not wildly different. At least averaged over a degree. I have not looked at individual sources, however. In the long wavelength limit, the it's just a quarter polar antenna. Yeah, right? Right. Okay. Yeah. So it differs by factor of order two from one direction to another. Yeah. Right. So the, the short wavelength limit is different a little more. Yeah. One thing that Frank was very uh, interested in for a while was to uh, to look at the um, what you might call the antenna pattern on the sky in the short wavelength limit, uh, and then we change the frequency by some trivial amount. And of course, the pattern would completely change. You know, it would just go plonk. You know, and look, it would just look different. You know, and so then we sort of I abandoned that at least because I didn't quite see how to interpret it. It was quite different from frequency to frequency. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you.